The Worldwide Church of God presents You're Included, The Good News of Jesus Christ. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. We're delighted to have with us again for this roundtable discussion Dr. C. Baxter Kruger, president of Pericoresis, an international nonprofit ministry. He's joined by his assistant, Steve Horn. Let's go around the table and introduce our panel. Hi, I'm Joseph Tkach. I'm the current president of the Worldwide Church of God. I'm John McKenna. I'm a doctrinal advisor to the Worldwide Church of God. I'm Mike Morrison, uh, editor of Together Magazine. I'm Steve Horn. I'm uh, Dr. Kruger's assistant. I'm Dr. Kruger. I'm husband of Beth. Well, thanks, everybody. Let's begin by talking about all the people in the Old Testament who, as many of them, heroes of the Bible, and yet they lived before Christ came and consequently never heard of Christ, never named the name of Christ. Uh, what happens to those people? Are they in hell? I've heard that said. Well, I mean, how long do we have here? I mean, <laughs> um, if you're asking me the direct question on that, I would say that there are two concepts that are important. And this is where your theology burst the, the wineskins of our present conception. But the first one is, um, the concept of prolepsis, which is there's certain things that happen on the basis of something that has not yet been historically realized. And so Paul says that God winks at the transgressions committed in the old times because he knew that the sacrifice of Jesus was coming. And so in essence, he's saying God was relating to Israel and to the world at large on the basis of the relationship that he would have with them in the future in, in the person of Jesus. That's one thing. The other thing is that Paul actually says, I think deliberately, that not only are all things created in and through and by and for uh, the Son of God, but he says Jesus, and he has in view there the incarnate Son. So just in the mind-boggling idea, basically what we're saying is that Adam and Eve and everyone after them came into being by the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. And so uh, what they knew of that how much they understood that, how they could process that, I don't know. But for me, personally, I do not believe that any person will ever wake up on the other side and meet Jesus and say, who are you? Now, Jesus is the one that knows how people respond to him. Now, everybody in the history of every religion wants to be the one in the position to say, well, this is what constitutes a response to Jesus. But he is the only one that is in that position. And Paul says in Colossians that the gospel has been proclaimed to all creation in heaven and on earth. So he's pushing the, the envelope that way. And I think that that relationship has been there and it's being revealed in some way that makes sense to people. And Jesus is the one that's relating and, and, and having that. So that's, that's about as far as I can go with that. What are the implications of that then for loved ones, relatives, or people in faraway places who perhaps never heard the gospel or perhaps never heard it in a way that properly represented it and therefore verbally accepted it in the sense that... Well, I mean, uh, who has heard the gospel properly presented since Jesus preached? I mean, I mean, honestly. But the good news is, is that Jesus, he's the one that has established relationship with the human race. He's done that. That's not dependent upon the church. It's not dependent upon our faith. The Father's Son has established a relationship with each of us in his spirit. And he's addressing us and we're responding. Now, the place of the Christian church is to be a witness to that relationship, to help people know who it is that they're in relationship with, what this is about, what their time and their history is about. So the church is to bear witness and to be a fellowship of light that brings light on what's really going on. Oh, it's not Allah, it's Jesus. And it's our job to stand up and to unpack and, and to proclaim that as the truth, not as something we create, but as the truth that is, that he's established. So... I think it's really important for us to recognize that we give up judgment on who's in, who's out, and what constitutes that. Jesus has established a relationship with the entire cosmos in his own incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And everyone at some level is aware of that. They may not be able to call him Jesus because maybe they grew up in a fundamentalist church where Jesus was so small and so mean-spirited that the only thing they could do was run from that conception because it was so non-human. And they're embracing life 
And I don't think that when they're embracing life, they're embracing non-Jesus. They're trying to find Jesus in the dark. And so it's the job of the Christian church to say, yeah, this is what's going on here. You're trying to embrace the real Jesus. You know, help people see who that is. I, I think one of the key verses in all this incarnational talk that we've had today is one you've alluded to numerous times, that all things are created for him, by him, and consist in him. And for me, one of the, um, I think, most misunderstood issues is this notion that uh, if you die before you hear Jesus' name and have a chance to accept him as your Savior, that it's all over. Somehow your God is handcuffed now, and you're destined to go to hell for eternity and, and have eternal torment. And what it overlooks is the fact that God is sovereign, and he's not a prisoner of his sovereignty. He has a freedom. And since he created all things, and all things live and consist for him and by him and in him, we're really not dead till he says we're dead. So, I mean, to me, I think about Lazarus. You know, he's dead four days. Yeah. You know, and comes back to life. And you think, the Gospel of John, written by apparently by the Apostle, you think, John, why didn't you interview Lazarus? I mean, this guy's been dead four days. And for John, he's like, why interview Lazarus when we got to talk to Jesus? Here's what we're looking at when we, what we're going to meet on the other side. He's, he's right here in front of us. Yeah. And so the revelation of, of who God is and what God intends and has planned and has accomplished is the person of Jesus in his union with us. Yeah. That's what we come to on the other side. Jesus yeah. conquered death. And in him, we're conquerors of death as well. The one who was slain before the foundation of the world. That's what I keep thinking about. Right. So we Uh keep bringing this forward into a point in time in history as if that's important. As if God is bound by time time in the sense of one second following before the foundation. Perhaps we could remember that he came in the fullness of time. And how are you going to flesh out the significance of the fullness of time without understanding he's the Lord of time, and he's the Lord of time past, he's the Lord of time present, he's the Lord of time future, he's the Lord Mm. of time. And he is the judge and savior of all time. So that when you're asking uh, questions about how he relates himself to time, uh, you're asking big questions, and you need to get the answers from the Lord of time. The way I like this concept of prolepsis that Baxter's talking about, I see Moses' confession already operating with the concept of prolepsis. He's doing it like this. Because the Lord bailed the people of God out of Egypt, I can confess the one who created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. It's in the light of redemption that you understand creation. Now that is, I think, fundamental to what the meaning of prolepsis is. That is, nobody understands the Creator without the redemption of the Creator. And this Creator is the Redeemer of all time. Yeah. So the And the Revealer. Yeah. The Son of God, pre incarnate, is just as timeful, and I think that's what you were thinking of. Exactly. The Son of God, pre incarnate, is just as timeful as the incarnate Son of God. It's just a different kind of time, isn't it? It seems like I remember somewhere that where the actions, some of the actions that in the Old Testament particularly, that several things were counted as righteousness. And if you take the definition of righteousness as being right relationship, that was what was basically given to them where they were. We have something to be coming along in a time where God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the entire cosmos in a period of time that was written about we saw that happen in history. We were operating under that particular point in history. And the basis of the covenant relationship with Israel was the circumcision that would happen to Israel in the in the flesh of Jesus. That's it all pointed forward to him. So the the old covenant was covenant in Christ, which he was destined to come and fulfill for them and in their behalf. And we're on the other side of that covenant fulfilled, but it's the same thing. We're participating in that. Hebrews it's, four today. The today of Joshua. Today where God meets us wherever and whenever God meets us. It is the today. It was all pointing forward. All the language of the prophets pointing toward the Messiah. And the Messiah is uh, the son of David. Son of David, I'll never 
take my chesed, my grace, from off of your house, like I took it from off of the house of Saul. In this way, you will be my son, and I will be your father. And you have that father-son relationship, something new. I mean, nobody before David is going to have this. Moses didn't have this kind of relationship with the Lord God, with the great I am the Lord God is. He chose in his freedom now, in the time of the monarchy, to give this relationship to David. Now, that promise to David is messianic hope. The messianic David is the grace of God by virtue of the fact that God was free to choose to do this for the sake of fulfilling his promise in covenant with his people in his creation. And that's why you can uh, talk about Jesus come in the fullness of time. The promise kept the righteousness of God. It's actually here. I mean, I, I was thinking a while ago about this, that Moses, somebody was talking about Moses, and, and with David too, it's the spirit of Christ that inspired the prophets who inspired mm-hmm. Moses. And so it's not like the Old Testament in the spirit is caught off guard with the incarnation. I mean, the incarnation is what's planned before the foundation of the world. So Genesis, the covenant with Abraham and with Israel and, and with Israel with the human race is not only a foreshadowing, but it's patterned after the new covenant that's not yet historically realized. This is just baby steps, and it's going to be fulfilled in Jesus. And and once it's fulfilled in Jesus, then we go back and we see that relation that God has had with all peoples all the time in Christ, but it was no way to see that during the days of that, that great darkness. Preparation. Preparation, fulfillment, and now revelation in the Spirit. The Matrix. Yeah, we're in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, I like even uh, this trajectory that we're talking about, that it has topological significance. So when when Jesus says they wrote about me, that the, he's not saying, see, Moses knew me and wrote about me. He's saying Moses wrote of God in such a way that he spoke of me even if he didn't know it. Mm-hmm. He was inspired by the Spirit Even if he Christ. didn't know it. And the, all the prophets are that way. First Peter one ten. Yeah, the yeah. prophets don't. They don't have any idea what they're writing about. And probably Saint Paul and Saint Peter had very little idea that they were writing scripture. They were writing letters. That's mm-hmm. all they were yeah. doing. And doing the best they could to write about Jesus. And yeah, it wasn't what it meant. Now, who who makes it scripture? Well, the one to whom they were bearing witness, Jesus, because he is who he is. Like the Old Testament was an unfinished story. Yes, it, it's a tremendous story, and you just wonder where's it going? Where's it going? Until Jesus comes along, ah, oh, this is what it was all pointing to. And, and nobody and, liked it. And the thing is, <laughs> the players didn't like it. And but the thing is, the real author of Scripture knew that, even though the players well, did. Sure. Yeah. And and counted on the players into the counted script. on the players' rejection of their own Messiah to accomplish reconciliation. And the real players in the story had no clue. That's, you know, we were talking, I think, last night about that Caiaphas was actually the only high priest in the whole history of Israel that did his job. <laughs> he offered up the one acceptable sacrifice, and he never did it, and he did it for the wrong reason. Yeah. 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 You know, he did it to, to save himself and the people, and he was doing that. But I think yeah. that's a picture of, of how, you know, God is a great chess player. I mean, it's just three-dimensional chess, and he's way ahead of what we think is going on. Mm. But it's all, and it's revealed to us in Jesus. Then we get it. There's, there's the purpose of God in creation. It's nope. the union between and humanity and... Bart speaks Actually, of the, uh, the debt of gratitude we owe the Jews for bringing about exactly what uh, they were intended to bring about. T.F. Torrance because at the womb of the incarnation, which is just a fantastic yeah. Torrance. Mm. And, and I think it's vital to, to understand it in this context that you're, you're now presenting because I've met... Christians who, and non-Christians who have a very different view. In fact, uh, they, they might look at first the angelic creation and saw that a third rebelled and so plan A failed. And then he creates Adam and Eve and humanity falls. Plan B fails. And so now we come to the incarnation and now we're all ready to plan C. God's failed a couple of times. Oh yeah, I mean, Israel failed. So, you know, you just, but that's the thing. I, I love to say that, and, I, and and that's just so important. Jesus, the incarnate Son, and the relationship 
that he has with his Father and the Spirit and the human race and all creation in himself, that union, that covenant relationship between the Father, Son, and the Spirit and the human race and creation, that is not an afterthought that God quickly thought up after Adam fell, after Israel fell. We've got to come up with a new one. So that is plan A, in the light of which we now understand what's going on with creation, and we now understand what the calling of Israel is about, and we now understand what the calling of the church is about. To use your analogy with the three-dimensional chessboard, when God created everything, he had checkmate. Yeah. (laughs) Only I was surprised. It should be like in either four or maybe ten or eleven dimensions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or twenty one. <laughs> However many dimensions there are. <laughs> checkmate in <and> all. <laughs> yes. But that's the beauty. I mean, Jesus is the re- he's the light of the cosmos, not just the light of the Christian church. And he's not only the one in and through and by whom all things are created, but for whom all things. Here in this person and in the relationship between God on the one side and the human race on the other, that exists in his very identity, here we see what God is up to from all eternity. This is the revelation. This is the unfolding of what's been hidden and what we could not conceive of. That's a Christological hermeneutic. That's the truth of all truths. That's the way to think as a Christian person. Really, every time you are going to read covenant renewal in the Old Testament, you are asked not only to read God with his people, but the creation is always asked, called upon, to bear witness to what he is doing with his people. God never just bears witness to himself between himself and his people. He always says, heavens, come over here and look at this. Earth, come over here and listen to this, because I'm speaking with my people, and you're my witness. So the creation... The cosmos is always a part of every covenant renewal you'll ever read throughout the whole Bible. And God enters into covenant relationship with Israel numerous times in the Old Testament that all nations might know that I am the Lord. Right. Yeah, and that's very important. To be a light to the nations. That's very important. Because Israel did what the Calvinists do and what the church typically does, which is we're in and you're out, and this is for us. And God loves us and doesn't love everybody else. And he's saying, no, I'm calling you, Abraham. I will bless you, and I'm going to protect you, and I love you, and through you I'm going to reach the world. One of the stated purposes of perichoresis under your supervision is recovering a relational vision that reflects the union of the triune God the human race, and all creation in Christ promotes healing for relationships, marriages, and families, and establishes a framework for international relations. That is a tall order, and yet it accurately reflects what the gospel is all about. Yeah, it it looks like if it's a goal, it's a tall order. How in the world are you going to do that? But if it's a reflection of the international relation that's established in Jesus, of the healing for all relationships, marriage and family, and, and, and racial and sexual, if it's a Christological statement, then it's not a tall order. It's something that's been accomplished and is now being revealed. And the more you focus on Jesus in terms of he's the Father's Son, the Father's Son, and the Anointed One, and he's the one in and through and by whom all things were created, The more you focus on his identity, the more you realize he is the point of union. He's the point of relationship. And he's already accomplished it in himself, in his own person. Now comes our education, our coming to realize that these divisions that we create because of our own insecurities and anxiety and darkness are false divisions. And we have a responsibility, uh, a global responsibility, because the cosmos is bound up in Jesus' relationship with us. And I'm a part of Jesus' relationship with you. And with people in Australia or India or Russia, is that this is a, of a peace in Christ. That that warrants a framework that says, wait a minute, we've got to rethink things here. Because it's easy just to see global and national uh, divisions and religious divisions. And even in the Christian church, a couple of thousands of denominations within the Christian community, within the Protestant community. But underneath that, there's a oneness that we have in Jesus. And that's why Paul says, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Because the unity is not, don't create it. It's there in Christ. Preserve it. Stay focused on that. And that, that liberates you from recognizing people or nations according to the flesh. That, that leads to an, uh, a question that we get asked when we are talking about 
the incarnation and all that that implies and how we participate uh, in the divine nature. Some will level the accusation that we're just teaching a, a form of universalism. How, how do you answer that? Well, I wish I could. You know, I wish uh, and hope and pray that the whole human race comes to see the truth. Uh, I have my doubts about certain denominations, but <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I am not a doctrinal universalist. I am a hopeful universalist, but I don't. What I say is the world is reconciled in Christ. We're included in the family. Jesus has established a relationship with all of us. He <clears> sent the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and it is possible for us to say consistently again and again and again, even indefinitely say, no, I'm going to live in my own world. I'm going to live in the way that I see things, the way that I see God. I've got my theology. I've got my vision of God. I've got my vision of the world. I've got my vision of what Jesus did. And, and I am God. And my vision is what counts. And Jesus, you line up with me. And everybody on the planet line up with me. And that creates chaos and conflict and internal pain. And it's possible for that to be an indefinite position but god never changes and this is important that what we do or do not do does not have the capacity to change the being of god or his relationship with us that he has established so we're not talking about changing god in from being a father back into being a judge we're talking about the fact that he has bound himself in relationship with us that's never changing the spirit is is haunting us and trying to enlighten us and that's the state of things now how it comes out we're not in a position to say with any kind of dogmatic reference it's theoretically possible that no one would get it. No one would see. And it's theoretically possible that almost everyone, or even indeed all would come to see. There are, there are people that I respect, uh, George MacDonald and Thomas Erskine among them. Great thinking Christian godly men. That just The love of the Father poured forth from both of them. They both were committed universalists. They just believed that the love of the Father was going to win. It was just impossible not to. And I, I think that's probably, you know, that's good, but I just can't say that. So, no, I'm not a universalist, but I understand why people who are operating out of a legal framework can only hear me saying that because for them, if you've prayed to receive Jesus and you got a ticket to heaven and you're going, and if everybody's got a ticket, then everybody's going to go to heaven. But the plain fact is there are people who don't want to go. And they may have a ticket and, and it trip paid for, but they don't no, want to don't. participate in it. But it's not going away, and it's a very miserable form of existence. Yeah. C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, fantastic, mm-hmm. talks about that. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, that was a nice way of a uh, nice turn of phrase. The way you explained that they have a a paid ticket in their pocket, but they don't want to use it. Um, well, in Lewis's image, that the day, the door of heaven is always open. Yeah. And even the door of hell, and and maybe even the doors of the same. It's the same door. I mean, it's not that we died. And God goes back into being God and forget this Father, Son, Spirit stuff and forget this covenant relationship. Sorry, all that's over. You had your chance. Now it's God in the flames. It's covenant relationship. And where are you in the journey? What do you see and what do you don't see? And you're not changing God in this. Yeah. But I think you would agree with me. It's it's almost an odd question about are you a universalist? Because when I look at the early church fathers, they all wrote with a hope that Everyone. They believed in a cosmic Jesus. Yeah. I mean, they, they believed that Jesus is the one who's, who's reconciled the cosmos. And so they were looking for the manifestation and the revelation of that. And they wanted to participate in the unveiling of that. We, we, our Jesus in the West today is, I mean, for Pete's sake, I mean, without the church, he, he can't even have a voice. We're, it's like we make Jesus Lord of our lives. I mean, yeah. who's yeah. Lord then? Yeah. I mean, the announcement is he is Lord. He has, Come and establish a relationship with us. Therefore, quit living in your own world and come live with him and his. Walk with him. Let him disciple you. Let him teach you about the Father. And there's a real difference, and I'd like to hear you comment on this, with between living in his faith and working up your own faith. We're going to have to, I hate to say it, but we're going to have to save that for another time. And I hope we can come back together very soon to discuss that point. But we are at the end of their time together. Dr. Baxter Kruger is author of The Great Dance, The Christian Vision Revisited. Uh, That book is available at the Perichoresis website at www.perichoresis.org. That's spelled P-E-R-I-C-H-O-R-E-S-I-S, www.perichoresis.org. It's been a great pleasure to have you here with us, and you, Steve. 
And thanks, everybody, on our panel, and we hope to see you again soon. You've been listening to You're Included. Be sure to check for future programs in this series on the Worldwide Church of God website, www.wcg.org. If you've enjoyed this program with Dr. Kruger, you might also enjoy the column he writes in Christian Odyssey, a free magazine that helps make sense of the modern Christian life. To order your free subscription to Christian Odyssey, visit www.christianodyssey.org. That's www.christianodyssey.org. Your Included is devoted to the good news that your Heavenly Father loves you, wants you, and includes you in Jesus Christ. Your Included is produced by the Worldwide Church of God.